Wow, okay. <laughs> All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for tuning into our Conversations with the Curator series. This will be a once a month lunch and learn style series that brings you behind the scenes of our collections and exhibits. Please forgive us. We are trying a new bit of technology that uh, both of us are still trying to uh, get a handle on here. Oh, okay. All right. So please bear with us as we work out some uh, some new technology here. My name is Sarah White. I am the Community Engagement Coordinator here at NCHGS, and I am joined by my colleague Tim Betts, our Curator of Exhibitions, who you should, you should be able to see both of us now on the screen at the same time rather than toggling back and forth, so we'll see how this goes. The wonder of technology. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. All righty. Oh. oh, this is very fancy. Sorry, it's, I'm still very it's amazed too by fancy all of for this. Us. I know, I know. <laughs> fancy camera. All right. So in honor of Jewish American Heritage Month, today we will be taking a closer look at some of the artifacts in our collection that were either donated and or loaned by members of the Jewish community that are on display in our permanent exhibit, Destination Northampton County. Uh, so without getting too, too much into a, a history of the Jewish community in Easton, because we could easily spend the whole program talking about that, um, we want to talk about just a handful of the uh, artifacts that we have on display. Um, importantly, we will start with um, that the uh, there were two really big phases of Jewish immigration into Easton. Uh, one, when Easton was still a very small frontier village in the 1830s, 1840s, and the next sort of towards the 1880s and 1890s. Um, so we will we will bear with Sarah as she figures out some. Sarah's doing great. Oh, I, Sarah's trying her best today. Okay. <laughs> All right, so do you want to just go right into the slideshow and we can sure. go from there? Yeah, absolutely, okay. that works. Right, super. Do you want to, I think you need to share it. Yes. I mean, I don't know. Thanks. Too many, too many windows. Thank you guys so much, yeah, by the way. Yeah, you're all doing great. <laughs> uh, so as a, uh, someone coming into Easton as a relatively new Ooh. Easton, like relatively new to Easton history, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the things that was really interesting to me, and I'm showing or I think is being shown, uh, the ledger of Michael Hart. Uh, this is uh, from 1793. Uh, Michael Hart was a exceptionally prominent Estonian. Uh, he was a uh, shop owner. He was involved in the formation of Easton's first fire company, the Humane Fire Company. Mm -hmm. Everything always circles back to the Humane Fire <laughs> Company here this year. Uh, so he was involved in that. He was kind of deeply involved in local politics and local, you know, situations. Mm -hmm. And I think as someone who is new, as I said, to Easton history, one of the things that really fascinated me is how... Uh, let's yeah let's go out and say it like exceptionally diverse easton was in the 18th century mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. easton is a tiny well was a tiny frontier town mm -hmm. uh there's kind of all of this talking about it as like this frontier village and as we've been thinking about it going into the 250th it is this uh last settlement before you get to like the frontier right mm -hmm. the so-called frontier uh so easton in 1780 this is this first census that happens mm -hmm. of Easton. There is 103 taxable men living in Easton, mm -hmm. which is, you know, that that is not the whole population. Right. When we say taxable men, we mean men who are owning, you know, who are owning land. Right. And your definition of citizenship in the 18th century is unfortunately exceptionally different. Mm -hmm. 11 of those were Jewish. That is a tenth, as 10% mm -hmm. of Easton's population. Mm -hmm. That's it's really actually remarkable. Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah. And I think that I think what we're seeing is this there's a plurality here mm -hmm. in a way. Uh and I think we could really kind of think of Easton as, you know, there's all this talk about it as like, you know, is this Pennsylvania German place, right? Mm -hmm. But in the 18th century, that was even though well, German was widely spoken, mm -hmm. but where people came from to be there mm -hmm. were very different, right? That is really kind of visible 
with the hearts mm -hmm. and really having to think of two separate hearts here. Yes. Uh, one, two hearts that are not related. Two hearts that are not related, yes. we don't think. <laughs> uh, so one is Meyer Hart. Mm -hmm. uh, he is a mate, he is more of a larger, uh, bigger deal mm -hmm. than Michael Hart, even. Mm -hmm. uh, and Meyer was first. Meyer was first. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. So historically first. Uh, he may have come from Portugal. We're not sure. Mm -hmm. He was a he was Sephardic, mm -hmm. uh, part of the uh, mass exodus of Jewish people mm -hmm. from the Iberian Peninsula, mm -hmm. really after 1492. I guess into my other life, I studied the Spanish Empire, so I'll put a <laughs> put a pin there because I could go on for a while. Uh, but Michael Hart probably is coming from another place in Europe, probably mm -hmm. German speaking, mm -hmm. probably long from you know, descended from being on the Iberian Peninsula. Mm -hmm. He is one of the 11 founders. He is the largest landholder in Easton. Mm -hmm. He is fundraiser for the first school. Mm -hmm. He donates 20 pounds of nails for the construction of the German Reformed Church. Mm -hmm. uh, and in order to thank him for that, mm -hmm. the German Reformed Church, which is now the First United Church of Christ, mm -hmm. installed a Star of David window, which is still visible today, to thank Meyer Hart, right? The other heart is Michael Hart. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, he is on Center Square. Mm -hmm. He is a prominent merchant. He is vastly interconnected with Eastern politics, as is Meyer Hart. Mm -hmm. uh, why I'm bringing both of them up in the mm -hmm. 18th century is because mm -hmm. they also, I think when we look at the 18th century and when we really look at everyone, we should look at kind of the broader complexities of everyone, right? So like Meyer Hart and Michael Hart were very prominent people in Northampton County. Mm -hmm. uh, they were exceptionally wealthy. They were exceptionally well-connected. That ledger, the, the page I've chosen from Michael Hart's 1793 ledger is the debt owed to him from one Samuel Sitgreaves, mm -hmm. a very prominent Estonian, very, who much. very much, <laughs> who later goes on to serve in the House of Representatives, the U.S. House of Representatives. Oh, I didn't know that. 1795 to 1798. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually have a series of really fascinating Sitgreaves letters Ooh. in our archive, which maybe more on those another day. Mm -hmm. So I pulled that page really to show how super connected Michael Hart is, gotcha. right? The other thing about Meyer Hart and Michael Hart is they appear on a document in 1780, mm. wherein both of them are listed as owning enslaved people. Uh, Meyer Hart owns uh, a large amount, uh, the 1780 cents mm -hmm. enslaved people's register. Mm -hmm. He owns, is listed as owning five people. Mm -hmm. Michael Hart is listed as owning one, mm -hmm. an enslaved woman named Phyllis, mm -hmm. uh, who we are going to... Uh, end up talking about a lot a in lot, the next yes. coming years in part because of kind of her story is harrowing and fascinating mm -hmm. and dark and compelling mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. uh but Michael Hart and Meyer Hart they can really kind of show us the 18th century in this way right because mm -hmm. we would think because of their Jewishness they would be marginalized in society in mm -hmm. broader Christian society mm -hmm. they're certainly not right oh they at least it doesn't appear to mm -hmm. uh they are uh well-landed, they are well-connected, they are able to amass wealth, mm -hmm. even to the point of owning enslaved people, mm -hmm. right? Uh, as with anyone, I bring that up, you know, really to show the complicatedness of the people of that time, mm -hmm. right? Like, this mm -hmm. is not a uh, condemnation of Meyer or Michael any more than it is a condemnation of mm -hmm. anyone else that shows up on the 1780 register, right. including George Taylor, right? Mm -hmm. uh, rather, what it is, is that when we encounter these people in the past, we have to think of them as complex people right. who exist in shades of gray, right. people that do good things and people that do really, in the case mm -hmm. of the 1780 register, evil things, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but both of them are you know, exceptionally well connected yes. and exceptionally wealthy. Yes. Uh, so I, I find both of them fascinating, and I also find probably was exceptionally confusing. I'd mm -hmm. imagine, just as an aside, mm -hmm. I find it exceptionally confusing that both of them are named Hart, and they're both in Easton, and they're both uh, Jewish, right? So, like, you could imagine that everyone is and probably prob some, maybe not related at all. Maybe not related at all. Yeah, uh, depending on like who you're reading, they are either related or not. So, like. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> right. So I find maybe them, documentation exists. Maybe it doesn't. Matter. Maybe it doesn't. Yeah. I mean, it's, we have to kind of answer the the holes in that. But yeah. Yeah. So that's yeah. 18th century. So it's like really this 
I thought they they are surprising to me because like mm. as a historian, I didn't expect that. Ah, uh, you know, yeah. Um, as we kind of go into the 19th century, mm -hmm. as you said, Sarah, right? There is this large influx of Jewish immigrants mm -hmm. in the new into the new republic. Mm -hmm. There was something I saw, and I thought this was fascinating, and I think it kind of tells us a little bit about this. Mm -hmm. In the 1830s, Easton mm -hmm. is the largest Pennsylvania town north of Philadelphia. Oh. <laughs> it was a thing I saw, and it was just kind of a thing I added to my notes here, and it's a thing I want to look at more, mm -hmm. but that's really fascinating to think about, right? Because I think now we, th we think of Easton as a, you know, I, I, I love Easton, and I've come to know it really well, mm -hmm. but it is this, you think of it as like a small city, right? But like yeah. thinking of it as a, the largest Pennsylvania town north of Philadelphia, I, and that's yes. interesting, yes. right? Especially if you're thinking of the Lehigh Valley mm -hmm. in general. And at, at that point, Allentown was really just kind of little, a little pin yeah, on the like map. Yeah, it wasn't a whole lot. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so something that I've been thinking about this outside of work because that it's who I am and I'm class A nerd. Um, I've been really thinking about it. Don't laugh at me. Really thinking <laughs> me about too, it. Me too, man. Me too. <laughs> um, the the phrase they were just a product of their time. And I feel so ambivalent about that phrase because on one hand, yes, of course, we're historians. We're trained to think about people as products of their time. Yeah, you contextualize. Right. But I also feel like too many people use that phrase to just dismiss someone. Like, we don't have to have a hard conversation because that was that was just the time. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's 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 so interesting to think about, you know, we have all of these records that say, yes. Uh, Samuel Sidgreaves owned people. Michael Hart owned people. But how do you have a deep conversation about that when people don't want to have deep conversation, when it's easier not to have that conversation? And I think, I think for, for me, it's, it's hard. It's a hard conversation to have like that talking about the hearts. That's hard, mm -hmm. but it's also, we owe, we owe the people that they owned mm -hmm. to do it. Right. Like yeah, yeah. we owe Phyllis to yeah. say that. Right. We, we owe all of them. It's yeah. our, our job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then even just talking about um, like the the store inventory that Michael Hart has or that we have from him doing his inventory, that alone is such a valuable document that's because right. it's it's like, you know, what are the things that were important to them in yeah, 1780? Like, it's like, well, what is the material culture of people living in Easton in 1780? Yes. Like, what are they? Oh, I'm like, that's, 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 that's a whole thing. Sorry. Like, I could go on about that. See you that. next week for that. See one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> spreadsheets about that. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. So, but are your spreadsheets color coded, though? That's the question. Uh, <laughs> another day, maybe. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, I mean, in the sake of time, I suppose, then the next thing that we've pulled mm -hmm. is... Uh, next next slide? Next slide, okay. yeah. Is on view in uh, Destination uh -huh. Northampton yeah. County. Yeah, it's the... It's a nice picture. Yeah. It is the nail from the Temple Covenant of Peace. Uh, at least I imagine that's the slide that we're on. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's the only one of us has to We need to figure out this sorry. element of the technology. <laughs> uh, but uh, so this is from uh, 1842. Mm -hmm. Uh, I am low key obsessed with this. It's really cool. Yeah, it's really cool. I'm obsessed with it for a variety of reasons, to be honest with you. Uh, so, this congregation, uh, the Temple Covenant of Peace, forms in 1839. Mm -hmm. uh, it is the third Jewish congregation in Pennsylvania and the 10th oldest in the United States. Uh, that alone is significant. That alone yeah. is significant. Like, those numbers mm -hmm. themselves are significant, right? Like, third Jewish congregation in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're here in Easton, right? Which yes. in, in 1839, it's sure might be the largest Pennsylvania town north of Philadelphia, but it's, it's still, still pretty back country. Still pretty back though. country. Yeah. 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 If, uh, you're, if you're at all familiar, like we can talk about this more in depth later too, but if you're at all familiar with Easton, you know, you're downtown, you move west, you go up the hill up to Sixth Street. If we're talking the 1830s, early 1840s, that was basically it. That was the edge of town. So even when yeah, we say literal the, boonies, <laughs> yes, I think didn't William Parsons called it like the Barons, something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Could you imagine this is like so, a tumbleweed. Yeah, I know. Sort of uh, but, so when we say the biggest town north of Philadelphia, it's still like the bar is low. <laughs> exactly, and I mean, like I think in part, you know, it's the biggest town. I mean, there's this whole culture of like inns and taverns here, which oh, yeah. including Lots. our own Bachman yeah. Public House, right? There is mm -hmm. this 
it is this important stop along mm -hmm. the way, right? Before, yeah, yeah. before planes, before uh, planes. Uh, highways, before any of that mm -hmm. to get to like New York, right? right. To film Philadelphia, to New York mm -hmm. and elsewhere, mm -hmm. right? But the- the To the point at hand here. To the point at hand. To the point. The nail there is from the first temple. Uh, this mm -hmm. is on Sixth Street. This is consecrated in 1842. Uh, the nail is most assuredly from 1842-ish, mm -hmm. right? Because it's used in the construction of mm -hmm. it. Uh, so what I kind of found fascinating about that, and we can talk about, I mean, the nail is hand forged, mm -hmm. right? And this is from a time before um uh, yeah go to the hardware store and you buy right. a thing of nails right this is a you don't blacksmith... buy a hundred in bulk no yeah. this is a blacksmith forged mm -hmm. nail that mm -hmm. is uh you know done on a you know an anvil right this is yeah. a lot of work yeah. to, to make these uh this and this is you know the same sorts of nails that uh Meyer Hart would have I mean an earlier version, but mm -hmm. the same 20 pounds of which Meyer Hart would then yeah. donate to the German mm -hmm. Reformed Church. Uh, and there are no nail guns, too. Obviously. There are no nail guns. It's, it's not like an efficient process. Doing this by hand. Every, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Uh, For what was a pretty massive building. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Uh, there was something about this I found really kind of uh, compelling, right? So mm -hmm. this is this congregation that is forming in 1839 they are practicing probably in a small house mm -hmm. right and then they're building their first temple in 1842 mm -hmm. uh in november of 1842 uh they have the con the consecration mm -hmm. of the temple uh, it's november 18th and they put an ad in the paper and they say mm -hmm. you know come uh, anyone of any religious persuasion mm -hmm. come to the consecration yeah. you know there's this this statement of like being part of of the community, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and actually, so many people come yes. that they can't fit them, yes. and then they have to give only like if they people can only get in if they have an admittance card, right? So aha, uh -huh, yes, yeah. So it's like this whole like ticket. It becomes very like it becomes ticketed, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, I think it's really really compelling, right? Because it is this mm -hmm. congregation that is forming itself in like, as we called it, the barons, right? Mm -hmm. Even though then it's starting to like populate it. Right. But uh, no, this is in between Pine and Ferry. But um, this congregation obviously was exceptionally important mm -hmm. to the community mm -hmm. to the point that so many people wanted to come that they couldn't fit them. Yes. Right. So it's like they are opening in eight, in 1842, mm -hmm. and uh, it is to a uh, broader community mm -hmm. that is happy that they're there, mm -hmm. or at least curious what the building is like. Right. right. So there. I mean, and of course, it's probably a mixture of that. And I'm sure you could could be both. In right? the 1840s, the population was three thousand. Yeah, Four thousand. Yeah, Somewhere not around there. Not, not great. Yeah, yeah. It's not ma not not massive. Yeah. It's we're getting to what it will eventually yes. be, like post Civil War, turn of the century, mm -hmm. Easton. But mm -hmm. yeah, we're not we're not there yet. But yeah, I mean, definitely that kind of surge of mm -hmm. interest is particularly uh, mm -hmm. fascinating. Mm -hmm. I think right. Yeah. Uh, and I, I find that just that nail itself exceptionally uh, compelling. The mm -hmm. the next slide is the ninety uh, fifth anniversary celebration from nineteen thirty seven. Okay. Um, there we go. Yes. Yeah, but I mean, which also has a really gorgeous picture of the front, the front of, of the it, yes of the building. Yeah, yeah, yeah which no longer no longer is right. That's a story in itself. That's a story yes. in itself. Yes. But I find the nail particularly mm -hmm. compelling, right? Because it is this. Do you want me uh, to flip back? If you, if you want to, I'm kind of like going. Between, it's, it's, I mean, they're related. They're related. Yeah. yeah. But I find it really particularly compelling, right? Because it is this um, as an object, mm -hmm. right? It is this really. Uh, it's in this little box down in mm -hmm. Destination or Hampton County, right? It has this little label, but it is this, like, I'm particularly fascinated, and lately I've been particularly fascinated mm -hmm. with, like, things in our collection that are parts of buildings, right? Like, uh, bricks or, oh, like, yes, yes. you know, like, or stuff like that. And the nail is really compelling and fascinating to me, right? Because it is this, like, to me anyway, it is this, like, a uh, reminder of, 1840s Easton mm -hmm. that the 1840s Easton that 
seems to have welcomed this congregation to its permanent home mm -hmm. in force, mm -hmm. right? And like, I'm not necessarily, I'm not, you know, I'm just kind of reading that onto it, right? Because mm -hmm. there is this like well-reported thing and it's, there's so many people there, mm -hmm. but that is really, I, I just find that particularly uh, compelling let's say, right, that it is this mid-19th mid century time. So it's like, there is this particular thing to it that like, um, kind of, it keeps continuing to surprise, mm -hmm. I will say. Mm -hmm. Oh, you, will, yeah. you okay over there? I'm, I'm clicking too many times, sorry. Uh -oh. Yeah, I think um, if, if you don't know, uh, my own background is really as a social historian. So I tend to look at things as how people would have used them, what they meant on a personal and communal level. And I love these, like the most mundane everyday things. Mm -hmm. Imagine how many people touched that mail from its creation up to it being placed in its finished product right. and then being saved and someone deciding we're going to keep this mail. Right. I mean, obviously there are so many things that are of value, um, like religious documents and, yeah. and holy items, but- The building itself. The people, the building the people itself. in it, yeah, but right, like- Right, right, um, But I, I love that and there's a term for it and I'm blanking on it now, but that, that like collective consciousness of deciding we are going to save a little bit of everything because everything has its own role to play right. and everything is important at the end Absolutely. of the day. And yeah. for me, like this will be the nerdiest thing I've said in a while, which is saying something well, for me as an object, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. I am, I'm obviously also very, you know, social slash like, I mean, like I tend really heavy material culture, but right. Right. Uh, one of the things I often think about and kind of theoretical approaches I have to thinking about objects mm -hmm. is this idea that we call the people that like me that write about it, mm -hmm. the aura, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And we can think of the aura, you can don't think of it in like that magical sense that like someone has an aura or yeah, something yeah. like that. The aura is that like, this is, you know, like this is my coffee cup, I touched it. This is the actual thing, right? Yeah. Like in a way that's like why when you go to a museum, you're really kind of amazed by the stuff you see, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's the actual thing, right? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. That's the thing this person touched, mm -hmm. right? Like to me, that's what that nail is, right? Because yeah. it's like, that is mm -hmm. the actual thing. Mm -hmm. And it's like, so it's connected to like, for me, the congregation mm -hmm. and the role it has in the community, mm -hmm. but it's also this idea that like, like I think of like, oh, someone forged this, right? Like right. that was the job they had that right. day. I mean, they're blacksmith, they, yeah. they did it. Oh, they probably went to lunch then. Uh, <laughs> and then someone drove this into something yeah. and what was it holding together? And then someone removed it, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, yeah, it's the, it has its mm -hmm. aura. And right. I think it has, it's like, it's more than just a regular nail. Mm -hmm. And you're all probably like surprised that we're like now talking probably for a while about a nail. About a single nail. A single nail. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, sometimes that's what you do, right? And that's, well, the, and that's the job too. I mean, you know, we, we spend how many, God bless you doing your PhD. How many years have we spent bogged down in historiography and methodologies? Too many years, sir. <laughs> unbelievable amount of time and you know yes it's important to know how to study history from different angles yeah, and I'm yeah. not I'm not saying you know don't study it but at the end of the day this is the stuff that matters these are the tangible mm -hmm. artifacts yeah. that tell the stories that we have to interpret right so what yeah, is the what sense I mean. in studying all of these methodologies and viewpoints yeah. if you don't have the material objects to use that methodology in absolutely and I mean yeah. that's why I'm museum right like I guess that, that's, why, that's I find, why we're that's sitting why at the table. That's yeah. so, so fascinating, yes. right? Because you can write about it or you can like have the actual stuff. Yes. Right. Do you want to go? Yes. Now that I we're other, half an hour into the Half an hour, yeah. Okay. But we have like other things. I mean, okay. good stuff. Uh, yeah. I have the confirmation service booklet okay. Okay. in there as well. Uh, well I, I think you're not looking at the order. Do you want to stay on? The next one is the 95th anniversary. Well, I was good. I was just pulling it to kind of do the okay. connecting. Okay. Yeah. Yes. By the way, I, we did have a question in the chat. This will be recorded and up on our YouTube channel. So you can spend more time on the images as as you need to. Again, we're probably talking really fast and excitedly. Yeah. Just, yes. This is what happens when you get a bunch of nerds in a room with each other. Okay. Uh, next up, we have the Star of David window. Oh, the Star of David window. Do you window. want to hold on to that or do you want no, to go? Keep, keep okay. that because that okay. is 
that is also tangibly from that building, right? I mean, like yes. it's it's yes. to to our knowledge and the yeah. to our knowledge. Uh, and it's just beautiful. It's, it's beautiful. And also, I I know the picture doesn't really do this justice, but it's massive. It I is mean, really it's big. A good, what four or five feet tall? I'd say five. Four or five is not a stretch. That, right? yeah, uh, math is not our ma no. Our we're, yeah, there's Sorry. reasons we do what we do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if only math. But uh, yeah, I mean, it is massive, and it is. I think that goes alongside my uh, my thing about the nail, right? Right. That it's like because not everybody can hand forge a nail. Not everyone That's a have, specialty. Certainly, not everyone can make a stained glass window. No, absolutely not. Huh. And I mean, stained glass windows have this long, and this is the really kind of the second window we've touched on now. Though the first one we've seen, <laughs> right? The yeah. first being the one that is uh, made to commemorate Meyer Hart's gift yes right yes yes but um this i mean like as someone that thinks about like material culture mm -hmm. and the role of it right mm -hmm. like stained glass windows particularly are this long 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 connected thing to mm -hmm. the sacred right yeah uh whenever I you know because I'm here and I also teach art history it's mm -hmm. like I do a lot of talking about like medieval cathedrals and stuff like that <laughs> and the thing about it is the stained glass right mm -hmm. the thing about it is the space and the thing about it is the stained glass and we can think of stained glass as something that's beautiful mm -hmm. and most assuredly that window is is beautiful mm -hmm. down there and it's beautiful with the light shining through it mm -hmm. but like for me like thinking of that as an artifact and as it would have had its use mm -hmm. right it's a window that the light is shining through, right? And like, yes. I think one of the reasons, I think one of the things we get wrong about stained glass, and by mm -hmm. we, I mean people that talk about stained glass, mm -hmm. is there's this whole thing that like, oh, stained glass is to teach, oh. teach the unlettered about, <laughs> whatever, right? <laughs> but like, really what stained glass does is it changes the way that the light looks when it shines into a religious building, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's what it does. It diffuses the light. And then mm -hmm. think about it like in that original context, right, mm -hmm. where it would have been in a building that like is constructed before the mm -hmm. main arrival of electric light, right? Yeah, It's going to be in that's a building. It's going to be in a building. I mean, maybe they'll probably be like oil lamps and you know, yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah. But like what stained glass does is it shifts and changes the way light looks. Mm -hmm. it, it takes you out of the physical, it takes you out of the real, you know, the mm -hmm. physical tangible world yes. and places you in a spiritual right. place. It's, it's not your kitchen window lighting. It's not your kitchen window right. lighting, right? It's meant to reposition you to think about the divine, mm -hmm. right? So I think it's, I, I love it. I kind of think it's a really cool thing. And I would love to know, and I, I don't know if we know um, where this window was in the temple. Like, was this above, um, like, was this something that was above the congregation? Was it above the rabbi as they were reading? Right. Um, and I, I think that would play a really critical role in the story as well. But yeah. I, I just don't think we have that information. I don't have the information. And who knows how many other windows were there as well? Absolutely. If yeah. so, If someone knows... I would love to know. Yes, please. Is, if, yes, if, if you have more, from, uh, by the way, yeah. this is this is also an ongoing project. Destination Northampton County was never meant to be a finished exhibit, right? So if you have stories or artifacts or information, um, not to dump work on you and Monica, but please reach out. You know, we are always looking <laughs> for community input and support and stories that we don't have. We would love for you to share them as well. Absolutely. Want to hit the next one? Yeah. Next one is, oh, a color photograph of the temple. Yeah, color temple. That is yes. from, I have my notes out of order. So <laughs> <laughs> that I am just kind of doing it to kind of bring us through time. Mm -hmm. I believe we said that's from the 1980s. I think I think that's that's what we have. The photo, uh, the physical photo that I had is undated. But again, if, if you have more information, please, please share. And if you have photographs, please date them and yeah. label them. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's particularly helpful. Uh, but like, I drop that in, right? And like we're talking about mm -hmm. how like the building, you know, mm -hmm. the, it goes through its life mm -hmm. and whatever that means, right? But like, like I just think, and I think about this, a, I think about the the way the landscape changes a lot, mm -hmm. right? The building. And I've just been like walking around town and mm -hmm. thinking about, because mainly because I've been thinking a lot about the 18th century lately. But um, mm -hmm. like the eight, 1980s photo, it's just always very interesting to me mm -hmm. to see these like, buildings from you know like the 1840s brought into like yeah modern context with a car yeah. parked in front of them right <laughs> I guess this like you know continuing because it's like 
buildings are historical documents, right? Like buildings are yes. artifacts, right? Like buildings are these things that tell story. And in the mm-hmm. case of this story, it is this kind of g- continue growing of mm-hmm. really a multicultural space, right? Mm-hmm. And that's like what the the story of, uh, absolutely the story of Destination Northampton County oh, yeah. is, right? This idea that mm-hmm. uh, Northampton County, and I mean, it skews pretty Easton heavy. So like Easton, mm-hmm. right? Like is like is and always had been this place of continued waves of immigration, right? Because yes. like, as you mentioned, like this, the Jewish story is the story of like successive immigrations, mm-hmm. right? Like mm-hmm. we can talk about like the first ones in the 18th century, right. but then there's like two major waves in the 19th century. There's like waves where there's a larger community and then they crest and fall mm-hmm. and then they get mm-hmm. larger, right? But like that's, that is this exceptionally important story Mm -hmm. of a broader story Mm -hmm. that is this continued yes shifting urban landscape right right and like eastern we can talk about how that changes right Mm -hmm. we can talk about um things like urban renewal and Mm -hmm. the way that Mm -hmm. changes the community we can talk about like people moving places as demographics changes work changes right and that's Mm -hmm. My hunch is those things I just said are going to be stuff we'll talk about in future months, given what I know our exhibit is. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> right, so it's like all of these are, uh, you know, mm-hmm. this particular story tells so much about the Jewish experience in Easton, but it tells so much about the broader, broader Easton story. Oh, for sure, right, for sure. Easton, I mean, really, since its founding, it has always been. A, a social hub of connectedness with with everyone who comes through, and of, of course, like everywhere else, it has its tensions and its changes. Um, but what what is fascinating about this picture, and I'm going to go back just for a second so you can see an earlier photo of the same building. There we go. Um, I'm not sure when the photo of the the bulletin here is printed, 1937. I'm not sure if that is when this photograph was taken. Uh, Presumably near then, yeah. So you can see that the build, it's undergone some changes, but it looks fairly similar. Um, But with this, the the 1980s photo, at this point, the congregation had purchased a newer building on 14th and Northampton. They had moved out of this space and I don't know if it was still a church, at this point, or if the church had also moved. Mm -hmm. But what's fascinating to me as a social historian is that even when it was the church, they still had the Star of David above the door. Like that that, that was the community, right? right? It was, was, and even so there is, um, there's another uh, synagogue that is no longer in use that was about a block away from this, that was um, a more conservative uh, founded by, uh, Jewish immigrants from what we would call today the Pale of Settlement. Um, I think in Eastern, primarily like from Lithuania, from way Western Russia. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that was built in the 1880s. And it's one of the oldest, still one of the oldest synagogues around. And it is half a block away from one of the oldest churches in the area as well. That was built in the 1830s, 1840s. And just that they coexist, like right next to each other. Like you can just turn your body one direction to another and see both of them. But that was the neighborhood. It right. was just people living side by side and getting along. And then urban renewal happened. Exactly. That's another conversation. That's a whole, that's yeah. a whole other, we definitely don't <laughs> we'll, have the time for we'll that. We'll get there. No, yeah. we do not. <laughs> uh, so let's, uh, let's head on to the next one. Oh, yeah, here's your uh, confirmation service. But I wanted to drop that in just because Helene is on. <laughs> I didn't know that was her maiden name, by the way. That has such a ring to it. Helene Estra Mermelstein. Who is, of course, our, I love her. our beloved Helene Siegel. Yes. Uh, here in the Siegel Museum, which, of course, is connected to a... Uh, long-standing uh, Jewish irony Estonian irony. business, yes. right? So. Yes, yes. And they were, gosh, they were around for 40 years before me, before you, before I before, uh, before us, yes. certainly. Yes. yes. Um, but again, that's just, that's just the continuation, right? Uh, not only in the name, but that Helene is still the manager of our gift shop. 
right? Appropriately enough. And uh, and we did just recently find a receipt. Uh, oh, yes. Yes. yes, yes, yes. Our uh, curator of collections, Monica Bugby, found a receipt uh, from our uh, longtime and beloved librarian, Jane Moyer, mm -hmm. in 1956, purchasing <laughs> lingerie from Sigils <laughs> for six dollars. Six dollars. Yeah. So it's like. <laughs> I, I, I put I, multiple, multiple, multiple for yeah, six dollars plural. Like... So... <laughs> Bring it up. Oh, here's your Moses Moses Menline Moses cigar, Menline cigar, cigar store. store. This is, uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, yeah, this is this is a whole. We could go so deep. We could go so symbolism. deep, and yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm putting that in, and that's a the. Hmm. Cigar store Indian is a very loaded thing. Uh, I'm putting it in uh, because of Moses Menline Cigar Store, which is was where the Alpha Building is now mm -hmm. on Center Square. Uh, in 1880, there were as many as six Jewish tobacconists mm -hmm. in Easton. Mm -hmm. Have I in part chosen this so I can say the word tobacconists? Yes, perhaps. <laughs> but it's also I wanted to kind of bring in these really kind of prominent. Jewish merchants, right, okay. outside of the 18th century and really kind of outside of the more modern department stores, which we do have a slide in there as well, because they're mm -hmm. featured in uh, Destination Northampton County. There's the cigar store, and he is having this, uh, he's quite famous in his time regionally, uh, Moses Menline. He has a particular mm -hmm varietal known as planter's delight planter's delight uh and it sounds like a peanut <laughs> it sounds like a peanut but <laughs> is not peanut uh and he's selling it right uh he is this kind of very prominent person right so it's like a, he's selling the product of course this is a time when people smoked more than now right mm. uh but he his store is also providing this place of community right because mm. it's like you are smoking, you are talking, you are trading news, you are mm -hmm. like a tobacco in a shop functions the same way that like an inn mm -hmm. or a bar mm -hmm. or a coffee shop yeah, functions, right? right? You've like, got your regulars, you've got your customers that you they, know you know they come in on Tuesday yeah, they, are, and they get the same thing. They are then as yeah. now the yes. place where news is they're the people Indeed. that know the most. Yes. And hair hair, you know, people that cut hair know yeah. everything too. Uh yeah, so I'm putting him in, he's fascinating, right? Like uh, the cigar store Indian, like as an aside, because mm -hmm. I feel like I should mention it, right? Like yeah. the very stereotyped image of the mm -hmm. American Indian, the, the indigenous peoples of mm -hmm. North America is tied since <laughs> the Europeans arrived uh -huh. in, the, in the Americas. So like 1492 and they discover tobacco, they discover tobacco mm -hmm. and then everyone in mm -hmm. Europe starts smoking tobacco mm -hmm. for a wide variety of things, fun and medical stuff. Mm -hmm. That gets tied symbolically to the Native American in exceptionally oh. stereotyped ways uh, yes. as like Native medicine oh. or like Native knowledge. But that's a whole, just to kind of like, it's an exceptionally mm -hmm. complex and problematic trope that's been right. used for centuries. Just to kind of right. say that up front. It, and to pull back with the, oh, it's a product of its time. Yes, but it's also our job to, to say why? Yeah, because it's like, product, it's yeah. like yeah. while this is happening, like while he's selling cigars yeah. in the late 19th century, this is like this is also this is peak, man, peak manifest destiny westward expansion time. So yeah. like, yeah, this should be awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, should, we should say that. Uh, but also, like, I, it again, the, the photos don't really do justice to the the quality of a piece. Uh, but uh, we call we call her Mini. <laughs> uh, but Mini is massive. Yes. Uh, Minnie could not be moved unless she was on wheels. She's like, exceptionally heavy. I think she's oak, like yeah, solid wood. wood. Yeah, yeah. It's just heavy. Um, but also for something that is, wow, I can't math. Um, old. She's old. Uh, she's in exceptionally good shape. Um, <laughs> See, and, and like yeah. she's an advertisement, right? Oh, yeah. that's really what yeah. she is. So she would have been mm -hmm. out on the street. That's where cigar right. store Indian goes. Right. Right. Uh, so like she's in uh -huh. she's in remarkable shape. Uh -huh. So I, I'm actually... similar to like how we think of the barber pole outside the barber shop. Like if you mm -hmm. saw one of these outside somebody's shop, like you, you kind of there. Selling. Absolutely. Yep. Uh so 
Moses Manline, mm -hmm. you know, one of six Jewish tobacconists in Easton. That number is boggling to me, right? And there is this yeah. kind of broader story. This is something I am really deeply kind of fascinated with. I was talking to some folks in the library before I came down, mm -hmm. right? This like broader history of cigars in mm -hmm. Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. right? It was this, really this massive industry, right? Mm -hmm. Where people were, uh, tobacco was being shipped in like really into like bath and places mm -hmm. like that and then people were purchasing tobacco and like rolling tobacco and mm -hmm. selling tobacco right mm -hmm. like it was a very big thing mm -hmm. so it's like tobacco is a large thing in and of itself mm -hmm. uh other prominent businesses are like a gardener who's running the lafayette hotel ah, contemporaneous yes. to all of this solomon strauss who is mm -hmm. running the rocky mountain hotel mm -hmm. on sixth and northampton mm -hmm. right hotel of course you know, going is major business, right? Mm. But if you're thinking of Easton as this prominent hub mm. on an artery between Philadelphia and New York, mm. which it kind of had been for centuries, right? Mm. You know, the hotel is exceptionally mm. important. Right. Uh, and it's, especially if we're talking about an era where we see like ebbs and flows of new immigrants, immigrants adapting. Mm -hmm. um, if you think, you know, you're maybe a 20 something guy who moves here, and you want to eventually bring your family here, where do you stay in Absolutely. the meanwhile? You don't have a house yet, yeah. right? It's yeah. it's the neighborhood hotel, and yeah. you know you're going to be surrounded by people who know how to cook the food that your mom made, or speak your language, or you've got a synagogue that's literally right down the street from you. Like, you settle in the familiar, and that's why so many of these hotels popped up, because there are so many little pockets right. of community. And, yeah. and I think I think, I think like what, what you know, because it's like the hotel is this different, has a slightly different function than it does right, today. Right, right, right. Like the hotel, you think of like a holiday inn that you just like I, stay right. at on the side yeah. of the road, right? Yeah. But, you know, and they have their function. But like in the 19th century, the hotel is this mm -hmm. like, it's a hub of the community. It's where the community grows from. Like as you said. Oh, right? yeah. And people it's, come it's also people just a place people. where like guys that are already living in the neighborhood, you can go there and have a beer or it's get a meal. Business, business is conducted, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, but like, and like the kind of thing I just keep thinking, right, as we go through this, right, like we've been talking like really about like the Jewish history of Easton, but mm -hmm. it is like looking at it, it is exceptionally hard to disentwine, right, as it exactly. should be, yes. because the, yes. the history of Easton is the Jewish history of Easton right. and vice versa, right. right, so it's like what we're seeing is this like these things that we're kind of pulling out, right, mm -hmm. like the hearts and the creation of like congregations mm -hmm. and the creation of important community hubs and businesses mm -hmm. right like that is happening as part of this broader these mm -hmm. broader trends right and kind of as that's happening we're seeing that this community is exceptionally intertwined with mm -hmm. the history and development of easton mm -hmm. as a whole yeah. right I think the last thing I have is the the the, the uh, department store yes. stuff. So yes. Sigils, Grohlman's, Lipkins. I, right? lo I love the little Lipkins piggy bank. I love that so much. <laughs> there was a moment I thought about putting my gloves on and bringing the piggy bank up oh. just because I love it and just kind of want to, you know, show it. <laughs> uh, but like the department store, if we're thinking about these like shifts, right, mm -hmm. in like and like Sigils, as Helene often talks, right? Like mm -hmm. Sigils was this really kind of revolutionary mm -hmm. business in and of itself, right? Because mm -hmm. it's like the the idea of like the bridal department store, right? Where yes. you would go in and it wasn't just a place to buy a dress. Mm -hmm. Rather, there's a place to like book your honeymoon mm -hmm. and get their hair right. and the, a one-stop shop, a bridal, yes. bridal yes. mall, I think is mm -hmm. the, the right thing, right? But it's like this 20th century mm -hmm. push of the department store, mm -hmm. right? Which now, like, I remember being like a kid and going to the department mm -hmm. store, right? Like now it's not necessarily something we think about, right? Because it's like, right. if there's a store that looks like a department store, it's going to be like a Target. Right. Yeah. Because there's like departments yeah. in Target, but it's not like the vibe of the department store. Yeah. Because it's like these department stores, Sickles Grohman's, you know, like they are like the one stop shop. You go in the building, yes. you get your things. Yes. You go to many of them might have like a soda counter or mm -hmm. a place to get lunch mm -hmm. or a place to get your hair cut mm -hmm. or like they are 
important business. Mm -hmm. They are very much product of their time, mm -hmm. right? These departments and all of them, the product of their time in a good sense, yes, right? Yes. <laughs> For well, commerce and all that, that right? Sense. I mean, like, you know, we can talk you know, like, yeah. what it all means and all that, mm -hmm. but like they are locally owned department stores where mm -hmm. the community at a time before, before the rise of the mall, right? Mm -hmm. Before the rise of like driving all sorts of places right, to get all right. sorts of stuff before the rise of like buying things on the internet right and the warehouses uh you would just go to the department store and it had all the stuff right yes. and you go to other stores too right. and like something like the hotel like something like the cigar store mm -hmm. like something like all many of these other mm -hmm. places they're hubs of the community right like right like you you could go into sigils it's not like today where if you were shopping for a, a bridesmaid's outfit or something say you'd be like I want to go to here for my dress but I want to go to here for my shoes and I got to go to this other place to get my hair done right like you would walk into Sigils and you knew like somebody was going to be recommending what dress would most look good on you what shoes were going to match it mm -hmm. how you could do your hair like you had that one-on-one -on -one with someone who cared about you but it's also yeah. like and it's just the one-on-one -on -one with someone that cares about you, but I think it's also like, um, it's kind of an endorsement to that, like a yeah, comfort. Yeah. Like there's like, you know, oh, if I go to this place, like if I go to Sigils, mm -hmm. I know the person that they're going to have in there to do my hair mm -hmm. is of a quality that these people mm -hmm. I already trust, yes. the Sigils, the yes. people that own the department store, view that their customers mm -hmm would mm -hmm. want right so that is probably this... also had like oh yeah my cousin sent me in here because she already used you right? exactly yeah. yeah so it's it's this kind of uh yeah i think it's this important yeah. community and place. certainly back in the day when you didn't have to drive 20 30 minutes to a store you walk downtown Absolutely. that was the thing yeah you could yeah. walk everywhere you could, go look, into look at, town look at, was the thing look at us millennials wanting a, to live in a, a time where you could I mean, drive to walkable go, cities walkable for city, the win right? folks i know imagine imagine the days of reliable public transportation mm. well getting ahead of myself here that's yeah. that no that's a warehouse valley conversation that's warehouse valley more on that in another month ouch yeah anyway so i i think what Destination Northampton County broadly and the Jewish community overall, and especially all the other stories that we tell and that we hear really on a daily basis, is just emphasizing that the story is never finished, no. right? Hist well, history is never finished. That's why we study it. But if you don't have that understanding, that human connection, and the, the willingness, I think, to see how every little of it is connected from the hand forged nail to the confirmation booklet to see how this building looked when it was built to how in the 60s to how it looked in the 80s like if you don't try to make those connections you miss out on so much in your own community absolutely and you're so like that's how you connect with people on a daily basis that's why we do what we do absolutely you know it's it's fun and engaging to to be in the library and to find all these artifacts and to to have that moment where you find the thing that makes all the other things fit together right exactly but what good is that if you don't know how to share it exactly. with other people exactly it's just you just found a little puzzle piece for yourself it's like doing the crossword puzzle unless you right. unless you yeah i go why not just do the connections puzzle uh, right you know right but like no yeah but the real is, fun is sharing real fun. sharing your wordle count on twitter absolutely you know? yes. yes no <laughs> No. Um, but yeah, so I, I do see that we have a couple of questions in the chat. So I am going to stop sharing screen here. I'm going to pull up the chat here. I'm just going to go all the way to the top and make it easy on myself here. Uh, da, 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 da. Yes, the recording will be available. Um, I like to do... Um, uh, closed captioning. I like to edit and make sure everything matches with timing and grammar. Um, so I can't guarantee you when I will have it up, uh, but we will post it on our social medias, our Facebook, our Instagram. Um, Wendy asks name of page. I'm not sure what name of page refers to. Um, 
Can you send a recording to those that are attending, please? Um, I I do not have your emails, but if you would like to, um, on our website, if you go to the top right-hand corner of sigilmuseum.org, there's going to be a contact link. Um, if you just shoot a quick message saying that you were in this conversation and you would like the recording emailed to you, I can certainly do that. Mm -hmm. um, Will you send out monthly announcements about upcoming programs? Yes, absolutely. Um, we do these conversations the last Wednesday of every month at noon. Uh, you don't need to register beforehand. These are all just uh, click on the Zoom link and let yourself in. Um, I do post them to the website. I try to do maybe two, three months ahead of time uh, if, my ha if I have all my ducks in a row. Um, I think I have posted maybe up until July on our website, which I will, I'll link the events page in the chat as well, but we also like to push it out again to Facebook and to Instagram. Um, so you'll know as soon as we know. <laughs> uh, CC doesn't always transcribe properly. You are correct. Um, so when we say Estonian, uh, we like to say that as um, folks from Easton. So it is uh, Easton. I-A-N, Estonian. Does it want to say it's Estonia? Like yes, like Estonia? the country, yes. Yeah. yes. <laughs> That's different. Um, Howie yeah. says that uh, the synagogue turned into the Second Baptist Church. I, I was blanking on that name. Uh, still is big for tobacco. I'm not sure what... Cathalia and Brandelsa have taken over as our new champs with the help of Jackie. And you know what that means? Okay. Oh, 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 I can't keep up. Um, are you connected to any other groups trying to do archives of small Jewish communities? Mine here is in Champaign, Illinois, trying is trying to work with um, University of Illinois. Um, we do have a good relationship with uh, the, the two synagogues that merged, I want to say maybe three years ago by now. Um, so that is... Uh, now on, they moved into a, another building on 14th and Bushkill Street, I believe. We do have a pretty good working relationship with them, and we are still trying to catalog uh, many of the artifacts that they gave us from when they did merge. Um, I am not involved in that process, so I can't really speak to that, um, but we do have some pretty good community relationships, and of course, in Destination Northampton County, the idea was to go out to the community itself and say, what is the story that you want to tell? So this is not a, a typical museum exhibit where the curators are deciding what to, what to include and what not to include. That was not the purpose here at all. Anything else we want to add in? Tim, Tim anything you want to close on that we didn't already discuss? I don't and I know that was I a lot. I, like, I, I don't think so. <laughs> Yeah, so many conversations that we could have that we just simply do not have time for. And we hit a solid hour today. That's we did long-winded for, did. for yes. us. Yeah, no, I mean, okay. not really, but. I, I mean, we could go for, but you guys have things to do. Yeah. Um, so do you want to give us a little sneak peek about what is next month? Sure. Uh, next month, I'm not sure of that date. It's the 20-something. Yep. One sec, one sec. Come on now, come on now. Uh, June 26th. June 26th. Wednesday, June 26th. Yep, June 26th. We are talking about, and I think kind of leading into the summer, we're kind of talking about two things we're working on, mm -hmm. right? So on June 26th, we're going to be talking about an exhibit that is going up in the hallway mm -hmm. behind me here, which, mm -hmm. that you know, uh, about prominent uh, Eastern architect, uh -huh. An activist, Tim Hare, yes. uh, a uh, really remarkable man uh, that died in 2020, uh, a large collection of his 
materials and archive mm -hmm. and artwork mm -hmm. was donated and donated to us by his husband Earl Ball. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are putting an exhibit together to tell his story, which is uh, really kind of two stories together, uh, which is the and they're intertwined too. Uh, the story of historic preservation mm -hmm. and movements towards historic preservation, mm -hmm. and the story of the LGBTQ community mm -hmm. in the Lehigh Valley. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, June is Pride Month, so. Mm -hmm. that, makes sense, I think. Uh, that Tim Hare exhibit is really uh, a partner exhibit to the exhibit that's going to be going into the Shrin Gallery upstairs, mm -hmm. uh, which is going to be something that we'll talk about kind of further on, which mm -hmm. will look at the historic landscape mm -hmm. and the way the landscape changed from the past to the present mm -hmm. that we have called Warehouse Valley a mm -hmm. changing landscape. Uh, so really all of our things about like urban renewal and the changing landscape, there is a method to madness here. Yes. yes. Fantastic. And again, that's that uh, Tim Hare, if you if you didn't know him well, was involved in, I'm not exaggerating when I say everything. Like any facet of downtown Easton, he probably had a hand in. Uh, so that that has been a story that is long time coming, and I know we're we're all thrilled to finally see it happening, especially here, and that that they entrusted us with our story is is really big and really important. Mm -hmm. um, so again, you don't have to register for these programs; just drop on in at noon on June twenty sixth, and I will um, again I will post to social media once I have this on YouTube and up and captioned. Um, if you would like, I will include um, the link to our contact page. If you give me one moment, uh, again, just um, shoot the contact form a quick message saying that you were in this Zoom and you would like to have the link sent out to you. And I can certainly do that. Look at me using technology efficiently. There we go. Oh. I should have sent that to the whole group. My apologies. Just after I say I'm using technology efficiently and then I do not. Um, so if you have any trouble, you have any questions, just shoot us an email and we will do our best. All right. We don't have any other comments in the chat. Thanks so much for tuning in and thank you for your patience as we work through. Let us know also if you like this format. Um, it seems to be a lot easier on our end. It feels more well. like a conversation. It does. It's, it's funny because <laughs> you would never know. I don't know if you can see the top bar or if you only see uh, Tim and I on two separate squares, but we're actually just sitting across from each other talking to each other. Um, so th this is much easier on our end. So if you like this, please let us know and we'll we'll keep working on it. Okay. And we will see you all next week. Next week. No. no. Next month. Next month. Yes. Again, time. Doesn't matter. Yeah. No, 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 we made it up. All right, everybody. Thanks so much. We will see you next month, not next week. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.